two years ago we provide study uh, we asked people who were diagnosed late and very late about the way uh, from they started to, to feel not good some symptoms appeared and uh, the way how many times it uh, took uh, to HIV uh, diagnosis and uh, uh, people um, answered that uh, it took about uh, from six months to six years. They went to a lot of clinic or hospitals. They visited a lot of doctors, private, public doctors. They did many examinations, many tests, they spent many, many money, but nobody offered the HIV test. From PHI Media, I'm Gordon Thane, and this is Combating HIV AIDS in Ukraine, Episode 221, Impact of War, Stigma, Mass Migration, and the promise of universal testing. You're listening to the Public Health Insight Podcast, your go-to space for all things public health and global health, from the sustainable development goals to the social determinants of health, as well as interesting dialogues about the diverse career opportunities that exist in these fields. Remember to subscribe to the podcast and leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts and Spotify so other people like you can benefit from our content. The HIV AIDS epidemic in Ukraine has moved through various stages, from its initial appearance in the 1990s to the COVID-19 pandemic, and now with the recent conflict with Russia. The access and uptake of preventative and medical services related to HIV remains a challenge for a country that ranks second in HIV prevalence in Europe. This is what you'll hear about in this episode, the final part of my conversation with Dr. Lopatina, who has worked as an infectious disease doctor for HIV positive patients at the inpatient department at the Kiev Institute of Epidemiology and Infectious Diseases. A good place to start is like there's there's multiple different phases and I think you started talking about it where you were first getting into medicine, HIV AIDS was becoming more of a topic being discussed in an infectious disease um, practice. Can you walk us through the different stages of the HIV AIDS epidemic? In the 90s, kind of first came on the scene. A lot of hospitals were dealing with it. And then most recently now we have the complexity with the COVID-19 pandemic and Mm -hmm. how the country navigated around that. And then with the recent invasion, there's another layer of it on top of everything that was already going on. So start from the beginning. So 1990s, HIV AIDS. Mm -hmm. How did that unfold? Mm. Yeah, the epidemic of cases of HIV appeared in Ukraine in 18s. And it was people like seamen, seamen, and Mm -hmm. sex worker women. And then HIV spread inside of uh, IDU's community. Mm. Uh, on that time, was not any imaging about prevention, and HIV spread very quickly. Then, uh, epidemic affected female of female partners of IDUs, mm-hmm. and maybe peak of epidemic happened in uh, mid of two thousands. And now we observe some stabilization of HIV epidemic Mm. uh, because of treatment uh, is accessible and we know a lot of prevention, uh, but um, we still far from end of HIV epidemic in Ukraine. COVID-19 did not uh, influence uh, a lot on HIV epidemic. I think Mm -hmm. because of treatment uh, was widely accessible for people, COVID-19 didn't lead to escalate of epidemic. Okay. Quick question on that. Was there a fear that it would? Um, Was that one of the things that when COVID happened, 
uh, in, in your discussions with other leadership, was that something you were worried about mm -hmm. happening? Or based on the information you had, you felt that the programs and, and treatment programs that were in place would make sure that COVID-19 didn't influence? Was that surprising uh, that it didn't go no, up? No, it was not surprising. If you know very good how virus uh, is spread, so this is not surprise for infection diseases doctors, for epidemiologists, uh, because of social isolation also influence mm. on this. Against the backdrop of ongoing conflict, Dr. Lopatina highlights the intricate challenges of monitoring HIV trends in Ukraine, especially in territories affected by conflict and mass migration. The implications of war on healthcare access and data integrity casts a large shadow over the nation's battle with HIV and its future outlook. But now, war. We see that number of cases decrease in Ukraine. But Ukraine now has quite big part of occupied territories. So we right. don't know what happens in, in, with HIV on that territories. Right. We don't count statistics from these territories. Right. Uh, another important thing that mass people move abroad, we also don't know what right. happened. Another thing that war is a risk factor for uh, all infections and for HIV and other STIs as well. And HIV is a long period uh, without any symptoms. My uh, mm, uh, suspicions that war influences on HIV a lot and the result we will see maybe in five, five years later. Not good mm -hmm. right, for, for HIV. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, very difficult period for us and we need to to do a lot to stop this negative trend but st so if you see only on statistic this is good mm -hmm. but if you think right. about future you need to understand that uh, this is not good because all infection diseases they get a chance to spread when natural disasters happened or war happened. So this is very good period for, for infection diseases to affect mm -hmm. more and more people. And you mentioned too, even the caution to looking at the data because you mentioned that there's, there's territories now occupied mm -hmm. that are not, no longer factored in. There's people leaving the country, so they're not followed in terms of uh, if they are a current infection or if it was undetected, so you don't have the chance to follow those numbers. So, But your concern is in five years from now, uh, because HIV AIDS, it takes a while for it to become symptomatic. Mm -hmm. You're worried that in, in, a, in a while from now, we really see the impact of what's mm -hmm. happening no. now. Ukraine's sobering reality as a country with the second highest prevalence of HIV across Europe reflects a nuanced picture of the epidemic. Dr. Lopatina underscores the demographic pattern with a higher burden in men aged 30 to 35 and shedding the light on persistent challenges of stigma and prevention efforts. Ukraine ranks second in terms of HIV prevalence in the European region. Wow, second. second. Yes. Uh, wow. So... Um, and that's not even factoring in five years when the war, the results of the mm -hmm. war. And most cases, HIV infection are registered in men, about 60% men and 40% women, and age, age 30, 45. 30, 45. 30 yeah. to 45. This is mm -hmm. the most sexually active period. Like in many other countries, unprotected sex emerges as a predominant driver of new HIV infections, accounting for a significant majority of the cases. But when you take into account the effectiveness of available preventative measures, it appears there is a mismatch between the perceived risk and the actual vulnerability to HIV at the population level. Dr. Lopatina believes that this underscores 
the pressing need for a comprehensive education and destigmatizing efforts. And uh, this is um, a very important uh, thing that people general, general population in Ukraine consider condom using uh, as a pregnancy. Right, yeah. right. People, unfortunately, uh, do not think about prevention HIV and other STIs. When uh, there is no risk of pregnancy, people do not condom, mostly. <laughs> So this is very important thing and we should work on this thing and do uh, a lot of prevention, explain people and provide information people about STIs and HIV. Mm -hmm. Because people know that HIV uh, transmitted by sex, but uh, mm -hmm. people do not think that this is about me, for example. This is about uh, somebody else, not about me. Why about me? I'm not, a, for example, a gay man. I'm not a sex worker. I'm not a drug user. <laughs> this is not about, uh, this is not my problem. I think that's really interesting. The, there's the perceived risk of, of STIs and HIV infections. People underestimate how much of a risk it is through even unprotected sex, for example, uh, not understanding the importance of, of um, something like condoms beyond just contraception, but in the bigger protection from STI, HIV. It is, unprotected is, sex is a male main driver. About 70% wow. in Ukraine happens through unprotected sex. Yes, wow. and 30% still through using dirty needles yes so this is um, still actual for ukraine drug using in talking with dr lopatina it is clear that there are many challenges that need to be overcome however as we went through the conversation there were two main themes that emerged the first health promotion to limit the risk of behaviors with an inherent increased risk of hiv infection such as unprotected sex. The second, self-stigma, social stigma, and stigma from the medical community. The problem this creates is people are reluctant to seek testing, and even when they do seek healthcare after experiencing symptoms, they often get misdiagnosed, or they don't get the help that they need. In Ukraine now, HIV test uh, is accessible. You can do this te test in clinics, in the clinics, and uh, medical mm -hmm. provider can initiate uh, this test. Or you can go to one of NGO and do this te test on community level. But if uh, a person associated itself with some key group, uh, this is good, and we have a subject for prevention actions. But person very often are not associate themselves as a key populations because mm. key groups also stigmatized in Ukraine. For example, gay men, they, uh, men can have sex with other men, but if you ask this man about this fact, they answer, no, 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 I'm heterosexual. Uh, so, yeah, mm. uh, because mm. uh, this behavior is stigmatized in Ukraine. And so um, another thing that medical practitioners also stigmatized HIV in general. Mm. And, for example, two years ago we provided a study uh, we asked people who were diagnosed late and very late about the way uh, from they started to, to feel not good, some symptoms appeared, and uh, the way how many times it uh, took uh, to HIV uh, diagnosis. And uh, uh, people um, answered that... Uh, it took about uh, from six months to six years. 
they went to a lot of clinic or hospitals. They visited a lot of doctors, private, public doctors. They did many examinations, many tests. They spent many, many money, but nobody offered the HIV test. Doctors, uh, uh, they thinking like only, unfortunately, HIV, this is problem, IDUs and sex workers. If you uh, are not IDU or sex worker, the HIV is not for, about you. That's why still uh, HIV, um, get HIV diagnosis quite late and very late when uh, AIDS developed about 50 percent of people get this diagnosis very late that's why quite lo a lot of people diet still diet because we have IRT very good regimens one pill one day no problem to get IRT but you need to get this treatment on time <laughs> <laughs> so some people receive this diagnosis very well when the health is damaged. And uh, HF work with medical institution. In Ukraine, HF has uh, 40 agreements with other medical institutions. We provide uh, free tests for these medical institutions, provide workshops, uh, trainings, and explain uh, medical doctors about HIV. We show symptoms, we show cases, and we stimulate doctors to think about HIV and stimulate offering HIV test to to people to their patients. I know that, uh, for example, in UK, United Kingdom, uh, there is a practice on some hospital to offer HIV test regardless of symptoms regardless, in, in emergency department. And they recently they showed results of this work. And thanks to this approach, they found many cases of HIV infection. The, so maybe we need to change this approach. Wow. Of course, this is about mm -hmm. money, but mm -hmm. how many cost of the yeah. test and uh, how many cost the case of HIV, not recognized HIV. And uh, now also HF uh, in Ukraine, HF has a clinic, we opened uh, HIV clinic, where people can get uh, tested and on HIV and other STIs and um, receive IRT. And also we have checkpoint in Lviv, this is western part of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Western part uh, uh, Ukraine is not so affected like uh, uh, South, uh, but the stigma is very high in Western part of Ukraine. So we opened wow. checkpoint. Uh, this is community mm -hmm. level place where people can get tested and consulting about sexual behavior, safe. Uh, sexual behavior and this place is very popular now. Wow. Despite effective treatments for HIV infections being available and accessible, there is still a treatment gap. I wondered why that was and why it turns out that stigma, so common and easy to overlook, had a key role to play in all of this. Doctors were reluctant to bring up the topic during visits and patients in turn were hesitant to start a conversation about HIV. Without a way to get doctors and patients to feel more comfortable and safe in these discussions, there will continue to be many missed opportunities for testing, early diagnosis, and treatment. So I think the more I hear you talk, in my head, there's two main reasons popping up, and I think I mentioned it before. 
There's obviously the not recognizing the risk in the public. That's one element of it that would protect against new infections. And then there's the interaction between patient and medical provider where um, the screening tool and the testing is being underutilized uh, in a way where someone's HIV AIDS case can be caught early to get proper treatment. What is the reaction of the doctors? So you mentioned AHF works with doctors across a lot of hospitals to, to let them know about the importance of HIV AIDS conversation with the parents. When you go to the doctors and say 50% of, of cases are, are caught in a late stage and many of those late stage HIV AIDS cases actually sought out healthcare many times and that was never used. What is their reaction to that? A very interesting reaction. Some doctors came to me after workshops and uh, talked about cases uh, when maybe they missed this infection. And uh, I remember one doctor say, oh, I think uh, we missed a lot of HIV cases. Wow. Yes, and also we invite uh, doctors to present their cases. How, mm-hmm. for example, how I find HIV case when I do not expect to find. <laughs> right. This is very interesting experience, and doctors show, share this experience between each other, like a peer-to-peer consultation. Yeah. Right. Good, mm-hmm. good learning. One thing I read in one of the papers was that doctors, so you're saying, yeah, doctors in general in clinical practice could maybe do a bit of a better job to catch it early, but it's a bit complicated because sometimes that might lead to conflict in the patient doctor interaction where if HIV testing is offered, the patient might take offense to yeah. it. And then that may make the doctor less likely to ask in the future, worrying about how it can create tension and conflict between the patients. So there's many layers to it. There's the clinical clinicians doing more. There's people understanding more the stigma. And it seems like there's a lot of things that are contributing to the situation that we're seeing. Yes. And also we study how to ask patients about behavior, risk behavior, because mm-hmm. in Ukraine doctors completely don't know how to do this work. They understand mm-hmm. Oh, the pneumonia, for example, happened twice. I should to offer HIV test. This is mm-hmm. doctors understand very well. But, but how to ask about sexual behavior. This is very import, uh, important for family physicians, for example, when mm. people uh, ask for care, but uh, they do not have uh, typical symptoms. And family doctors must ask their patients about their life, so about their sexual mm. behavior, behavior, and they don't know how to do it. This is soft skills mm. that they need to improve. And may, uh, maybe mm, this is more complicated than, than simply provide professional medical information about symptoms. Right. And doctors, how I asked uh, people about sex, for example, uh, uh, what I need to do? Do I need to ask a man about sex with men? They mm. will offend me and this is very important to learn that them how to do this in proper manner very quiet very natural manner so this is more complicated thing and mm-hmm. ambition task for HF than mm. simply to tell about symptoms in a visionary outlook dr lapatina advocates for a paradigm shift towards universal testing, essentially transforming the standard approach to addressing HIV AIDS in Ukraine. This way may hold some promise in terms of reaching the commitment to the 95-95-95 target. What this means is when 95% of HIV positive people know their diagnosis, 95% of these are receiving the appropriate treatment, 
and 95 of those have viral suppression from the treatment. If you could change one thing to create the best improvement in terms of how HIV AIDS is handled at the population level in Ukraine, what would that one thing be? I think to test everybody one, mm -hmm. once a life. This is, will be a very good thing. And then to treat people who need this. Simple. Simple. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, I mean, it makes, to your point, it makes sense. I think one of the reasons I'm intrigued by the universal mm -hmm. testing is because it gets rid of um, a little bit the stigma. Because it's not, oh, you're testing because you did something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just, exactly. no, no, everybody, everybody tests, mm -hmm. no worries. Yeah. It's just, everybody tests whether it's high risk or low mm -hmm. risk. So you don't have to be nervous about it. But when it's, oh, we only test certain people, people are also then scared of the test because it's stigmatizing to even test in the first place. Because people make assumptions about, oh, what did you do why you needed to get an HIV test? I can see why you said universal mm -hmm. testing mm -hmm. yeah. across the board is, is important. This show was edited by me, Gordon Thane, with additional editing from LaShawn Benedict. Sound design and mixing by myself and LaShawn Benedict. The original music from The Music Room, composed by Tom Fox, licensed from Johnny Harris. The cover art design for our show by LaShawn Benedict. The Public Health Insight podcast is produced by PHI Media. Thank you for listening to the Public Health Insight podcast. Your go-to space for informative conversations, inspiring community action. If you enjoy our podcast, be sure to subscribe and leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. See you in the next one.